was Sunday, December 25th, 1977. Pastor Orville Smith had dedicated the entire evening services Straightway Baptist Church to the children's Christmas program. The Little White Church, just off of State Route 73 in Bryant, Alabama, was filled to capacity with moms, dads, grandmas, grandpas, aunts, and uncles waiting anxiously in the dimly lit sanctuary. Weeks earlier, the primary Sunday school teachers, Sister Carolyn Harris and Sister Becky Huckabee, had helped our class construct the props for our part in the Christmas play. We cut out simple, large, four-pointed stars out of cardboard, attached a wooden stick to them, and then wrapped all of it with shimmering aluminum foil. Then the teachers glued a letter on each of the stars, and all together they spelled the word Christmas. With each letter came a few lines that told the story of Jesus' birth, which we had to memorize. I was the letter T. The memory of that night is still vivid in my mind. I was hurting. Somehow earlier in the day, probably running around in the churchyard, I sprained my ankle. The swollen and tender foot kept me in a very noticeable limp. We were moments away from our part in the evening's program that Christmas night as I hobbled over to the platform stairs with my silvery star in my hand. To my five-year-old mind, those steps looked like a mountain. It was then that I felt the tender arm of my mother wrap around me and lift me up onto the stage. A row of nine tiny wooden chairs met me as I was helped over to the sixth one from the left. My best friends, Evan and LeBron, were with me. LeBron was the letter I, and Evan was the letter M next to me. One by one, the letters rang out from each child. C is for the Christ, born on this day, underneath the stars, in a manger he lay. H is for the hay, so soft and sweet, where animals rested and the baby did sleep. R is for the radiant star hanging so bright over the stable, a beacon in the night. I is for the inn, so busy and full, but in a small stable was born something wonderful. S is for the shepherds watching their sheep awakened by the angels from their night's sleep. It was my turn. I rose from my little seat and shuffled painfully forward. My heart was racing. I tried not to look at the faces of my church family, fearing that I might become petrified and forget my line. But without the slightest stumble, the words that I had practiced with my mother and father poured effortlessly from my lips. T is for the travelers come from afar, following the light of that special star. I turned and did a one-legged bunny hop back to my seat, meaning Evan on his way to the front. M is for Mary, so brave and so mild, cradling gently her precious child. A is for the angels singing on high, proclaiming the news, filling the sky. S is for the Savior from God above, forgiving our sin through His love. Relieved that it was over, most of us children forgot to begin to sing. Sister Carolyn's voice started to quietly whisper sing the climax of our Christmas performance, soft enough so as not to be heard by the congregation, but loud enough to urge us all to sing the hymn that we had practiced over and over for the last several weeks. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. 
This Christmas memory and the hymn that we sang are forever fresh in my mind. As our voices rose singing O Little Town of Bethlehem that night in 1977, it felt as though time folded, connecting us to a distant yet familiar past. Its rich wording brought the hills of Bethlehem close to my young heart then, as it still does to this day. The hymn we sang that night at Straightway Baptist Church was not its first performance, yet it was not altogether unlike the first time, over a hundred years before, when its beautiful strains flooded the hearts and minds of its hearers with visions of that first Christmas morn. And it was a Christmas memory of all things, rich in history and spiritual stirring, that first breathed life into a little town of Bethlehem, a memory that has since become a treasured part of countless Christmas celebrations, including ours in that little mountain church on the side of the road so many years ago. I'm Ronnie Brown, and this is Forgotten. Six foot four inch tall, 300 pound frame of Phillips Brooks loomed over the desk in his study, making his Bible, his writing pad, and the few other books before him look small in comparison. He was preparing the Sunday morning sermon he would preach at Holy Trinity Church in Philadelphia that coming Lord's Day in December of 1868. But another pressing task kept his mind distracted from thinking through the discourse for the quickly approaching worship service. The children, those precious children, who he loved as his own, being unmarried and childless, were without a special Christmas performance. Since becoming the rector of Holy Trinity Church six years before, he had made it a point to have the children, accompanied by the whole Sunday school class department, sing a special song before the congregation in celebration of the birth of Christ. He knew from his own upbringing how important it was for children to lodge within their hearts the lyrics of faithful Christian hymns. His parents, descendants from a long line of Puritan heritage that dated back to the 16th century settlers of the New England region, taught their sons to memorize hymns. For amusement on the Lord's Day evening, they would challenge each other to the reciting of hymns. Those hymns would never leave Phillips Brooks, and the number that he could recall from memory grew to over 200 by the time he attended Harvard University. These hymns became well-placed flashes of light during his preaching, recalled at a moment's notice, and resonated deeply with his hearers. But what would the children sing, he thought. Over the past few years, they had gone through some of the most memorable hymns sung at Christmas. Brooks wanted something new, something that would draw the children in close to the scene of the holy child Jesus, swaddled in cloths and laying in a manger. He wanted them to picture in their minds the scene and to reflect in wonder at the hillside surrounding the little town where the angels declared the arrival of the Messiah to a handful of lowly shepherds. It was then that Phillips Brooks was transported in mind to another place and another time. Some three years before, in the summer of 1865, Brooks booked passage to a once-in-a-lifetime tour of the Holy Land. For months, he had ventured in slow-moving caravans through the northern countryside of Galilee. He walked through the small towns of Capernaum and Bethsaida, where the Savior worked wonders among the people. He visited Nazareth, the hometown of Jesus, and gazed across the valley of Jezreel from the heights of Mount Tabor and Mount Carmel and from the ancient fortress city of Megiddo. 
but by late December, he had worked his way back to the holy city of Jerusalem. On December 24th, Phillips Brooks started out on a five-mile journey on horseback from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. In a letter to his family, he writes, quote, After an early dinner, we took our horses and rode to Bethlehem. It was only about two hours when we came to the town, situated on an eastern ridge of a range of hills surrounded by its terraced gardens. It is a good-looking town, better built than any other we have seen in Palestine. The great church of the Nativity is its most prominent object. It is shared by the Greeks, Latins, and Armenians, and each church has a convent attached to it. We were hospitably received in the Greek convent and furnished with a room." End quote. By twilight, he was guided back out onto the surrounding hills of Bethlehem, and there cast his eyes over the fields where, according to tradition, the shepherds encountered the celestial host, bringing the glad tidings that a Savior had been born. Like the shepherds, the pastor made his way toward the small town silhouetted against the backdrop of a starry sky. Brooks then made his way into the Church of the Nativity, the church was filled to capacity for the Christmas Eve service. The air was thick with the pungent aroma of incense. The melodic voices of hundreds singing ancient songs of the nativity thundered among the arches of the majestic cathedral. From 10 o'clock that night until 3 the following morning, a sense of wonder and awe enraptured the American pastor pilgrim as he realized his nearness to the event that divided time itself, the gift from heaven above, the birth of God's own redeeming son. But among those resounding voices, Phillips Brooks heard another. Amidst the hymns of praise in the ancient church, he felt as if he could hear the familiar voices of his Sunday school children back in Philadelphia. In a letter to the children of his church, he writes, quote, I do not mind telling you, though, of course, I should not like to have you speak of it to any of the older people of the church, that I am much afraid the younger part of our congregation has more than its share of my thoughts and interest. I cannot tell you how many Sunday mornings since I left you I have seemed to stand in the midst of of a crowded schoolroom again and look about and know every face in every class just as I used to. Nor how many times I have heard one of our own hymns ringing very strangely and sweetly through the different music of some faraway country. I remember especially on Christmas Eve when I was standing in the old church in Bethlehem close to the spot where Jesus was born, when the whole church was ringing hour after hour with the splendid hymns of praise to God, how again and again it seemed as if I could hear voices that I knew well telling each other of the wonderful night of the Savior's birth as I had heard them a year before." End quote. The tears falling from the pastor's eyes jolted him back from his memory of that night, but not before a few lines that he had composed as he walked away from the old church in Jerusalem resurfaced from the depths of memory. Through the years since, from time to time, he had revisited the single poetic couplet describing the stillness of the sleepy little town but further lines refused to emerge. But now, at his desk, the existing lines were joined by a steady stream of others until all five verses of O Little Town of Bethlehem were complete.
As the haunting melody of reminiscence gently faded, Phillips Brooks gazed upon the ink-stained paper before him where the verses of O Little Town of Bethlehem lay in their newborn form. His heart, still echoing with the vivid memories of that holy night in Bethlehem, knew that these words needed a voice, a melody to carry them into the hearts of his beloved congregation. It was then that his thoughts turned to Lewis Redner. Lewis Redner was a Sunday school teacher as well as the superintendent of the Sunday school at Holy Trinity Church. Although he was the church organist, he had no formal musical training. His talent was driven by his deep love of Christian hymnody. Phillips Brooks knew that Lewis had a gift to construct original melodies and would be the perfect custodian for these verses. Making his way through the cold over to Redner's residence the next day, the two exchanged customary pleasantries despite the surprising visit. The rector wasted no time and got straight to the point. With a hopeful glint in his eyes, conveying a silent message of urgency, Brooks relayed the reason for his visit. Quote, Lewis, I've been pondering the children's Christmas performance for this coming Sunday, he said. And from reflections of my visit to Bethlehem a few years ago, I have penned some verses about the wonderful night of our Savior's birth, end quote. With a playful grin, the pastor asked, quote, Lewis, why not write a new tune for my poem? If it's a good one, I will name it St. Louis after you, end quote. Without hesitation, the musician jumped at the chance to add his talents to the noted pastor's special children's project. In the mind of the pastor, such a skilled musician as Redner should have ample time to craft the perfect melody for this unique Christmas hymn. But Redner was a very busy man. Lewis was not only the church organist and played an outsized role in the inner workings of Holy Trinity Church's Sunday School Department. He also worked as a real estate agent in the city of Philadelphia. Deeply moved by the exquisite lyrics, Lewis knew that the melody for the hymn had to be exceptional. He took solace that he had the better part of a week to compose a suitable melody for the carol. But the days hurried away. There were deadlines to meet and lessons to prepare. Lewis Redner was also deeply involved with many religious and charitable organizations. There were concerns for the orphans and tasks for the homeless, all of which called for special attention during the Christmas season. Redner was sure that even as he performed these many tasks, with the lyrics continually in the back of his mind, he would soon be humming a tune perfectly joined with the beauty of the song. But alas, the melody never came. Concerned that he had not heard from his musician, Phillips Brooks visited Lewis that Friday evening, which happened to be Christmas Day. Lewis recounts, quote, Mr. Brooks came to me on Friday and said, Redner, have you ground out that music yet to a little town of Bethlehem? I replied, no, but that he should have it by Sunday, end quote. Although he reassured the pastor, in his heart, the musician was somewhat concerned. Quote, on Saturday night previous, my brain was all confused about the tune. I thought more about the Sunday school lesson than I did about the music, end quote. That night, Lewis pillowed his head, telling himself that a good night's rest might be just what is needed to open the doors of melodic creativity, but was unsure that rest was the answer. After a few tossed and worried fleeting thoughts, the organist fell asleep. It was then that something wonderful took place. 
in the darkened hours of midnight. Perhaps the same angels that sang to the shepherds announcing the Savior's birth began to sing a melody into the churchman's ear. Lewis remembers, quote, I was roused from sleep late in the night, hearing an angel strain whispering in my ear, and seizing a piece of paper, I jotted down the treble of the tune as we now have it, end quote. Before the morning's light, with those few bars of notes in hand, Redner hurried to the church. Sitting at the church's organ, the musician tapped out the harmonies to the sublime melody graciously given in the night. During the Sunday school hour, Redner gathered together 36 eager children with six other teachers and began to rehearse the freshly composed hymn. Within a few hours, the angelically dulcet voices of children, with a few scattered adults, filled the hushed sanctuary of Holy Trinity Church with the first performance of a little town of Bethlehem. History gives us no peek into the hallowed walls of Holy Trinity Church on that December 27th Sunday morning in 1868, but I can well imagine that as the last dwindling echoes of the closing words of this newly penned hymn of worship began to pass out of hearing, the hearers burst into claps and shouts of praise and exaltation. No mother's cheek was dry, no father's heart unmoved, for all were transported in their minds to the wondrous events that took place in the little town of Bethlehem. In the lingering worry in Bishop Brooks' mind was resolved into heartfelt praise to God through the tenderly graceful melody composed by his trusted friend. And I cannot help but think that Redner turned his eyes to heaven in relief, thanking God above for his midnight visitation. history does tell us is that the hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem, did not instantly become a Christmas classic. In fact, both Bishop Brooks and Lewis Redner thought that neither the lyrics nor the hymn would, quote, live beyond that Christmas of 1868, end quote. But as Redner later recounts in a letter, a local bookstore owner down on Chestnut Street, west of 13th Street, Richard McCauley printed the hymn on leaflets for sale not long after its first performance. The hymn's true journey beyond the walls of Holy Trinity Church and its surrounding community began by weaving its way through the congregations of the Protestant Episcopal Church. Its first significant moment in the spotlight came in 1874 when it was included in The Church Porch, a widely distributed collection of hymns and services tailored for Sunday schools. This influential compilation was the work of Reverend Dr. William R. Huntington, the rector of All Saints Church in Worcester, Massachusetts. As promised by Phillips Brooks, the hymn was initially called St. Louis, changing its spelling so as not to embarrass its composer. Over time, this title has become known as the name of the musical composition to distinguish Lewis Redner's original tune from other musical settings that would later pair with Brooks' endearing words. Another landmark in the hymn's journey to Christmas Carol prominence occurred in 1892, a year that saw a little town of Bethlehem embraced into the revered pages of the official church hymnal of the Episcopal Church, cementing its place in the heart of Christian worship. Although there are many renderings of the hymn, 
using an array of musical compositions. Redner's unique melody is by far the most beloved. Of the top 10 best-selling Christmas albums of all time, three of the artists, Elvis Presley, Nat King Cole, and Barbra Streisand, recorded O Little Town of Bethlehem, and all of them are sung to Redner's original score. There is little doubt that for many, the quaint hymn of Brooks and Redner has been woven into the very fabric of our collective Christmas memory. Although the melody of a Christmas song may be woven into the music of our celebrations, or the strains of a holiday chorus may intensely stir the deepest memories of Christmas past. A Christmas carol's true measure lies not in their harmonies, but in the profound and enduring message they carry. O little town of Bethlehem calls us to look upon not simply a babe born in the deplorable conditions of a filthy stable, but upon the miraculous gift of God. In that little town, under the starlit sky, the promise of redemption had arrived, and the unfolding events that followed would forever change the course of history. It was there, in the quietude of a stable, that the Savior of the world was born. The eternal Word of the Father was robed in the human flesh, declared by celestial angels, revealed to lowly shepherds, sought by far-reaching magi, and hunted by a maddened king. This Jesus, born in Bethlehem, came into a world riddled with sin, but not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Each of us, ruined and wrecked by sin, are called to peer upon the gift of God, from the manger to the cross to the empty tomb, and see the Lamb of God, whose life was given for our redemption. This manifestation of God's grace, this Christ child, is truly the consummate resolution to all the hopes and fears of all our years, offering us redemption and restoration. Amid the struggles and uncertainties of our lives, the living Christ makes his silent yet powerful entrance into our world and hearts. He comes to offer peace, to mend the broken, to bring everlasting light to shine down the darkened streets of our lives. This is the good news of the gospel. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Phillips Brooks' hymn distills the essence of the gospel message, particularly in the third verse, whose splendidly elegant words resound the theme of Christ's silent arrival into believing hearts. How silently, how silently, the wondrous gift is given, so God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. In my study of this beautiful hymn, I turned up one more account from history where the hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem, played a role. Stick around after this brief commercial break to hear more about the influence of this timeless hymn. The account of the writing of the hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem, would not be possible 
if Phillips Brooks had not taken his Holy Land excursion. Seeing the place of the birth of Christ and experiencing the moment of worship within the Church of the Nativity were essential to Bishop Brooks pinning those memorable words. This past January, I had the incredible opportunity, thanks to my precious wife, of taking a nine-day Holy Land tour. And I can tell you from my experience that it has shed light on my understanding of the Word of God as nothing else. I still find myself, now several months removed, digesting in my mind everything that I saw and learned on that trip. The Sea of Galilee, Mount Carmel, Tel Megiddo, the town of Magdala and Capernaum, the Holy City, the Temple Mount, the Garden of Gethsemane, the Garden Tomb, Shiloh, the Dead Sea, all these were visits that I will never forget. And these are just a few of the sites that I saw. I highly recommend such a trip when the opportunity presents itself. I understand there are a lot of different agencies for just such a trip, but I want to highly recommend the Yael Group. They organized an amazing tour with a guide that was incredibly knowledgeable and a staff that were with us every step of the way. This is not a paid advertisement. I don't gain anything from them for this promotion. I just want my listeners to go if they have the chance. And there is no better agency to utilize than the Yael Group. Just go to go-yael for more information. That is go-yael.com. Also, Because of the many requests to publish the transcripts of each of these episodes of the Forgotten Podcast, I have edited them into two books, Forgotten, Salvations and Martyrs, and Forgotten, Servants and Missionaries. These two are available both physically and digitally. You can order soft cover copies for each book at ForgottenPodcast.com slash books. Each book order will be accompanied with several forgotten podcast promotional items such as cards, bookmarks, and decals. These books are also available in digital format for the Amazon Kindle. You can find them on Amazon by using the link ForgottenPodcast.com slash Kindle. of December 1941, a time shadowed by the onset of World War II, it would seem that the very notion of celebrating Christmas would be incongruous against the backdrop of global uncertainty and fear. The attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th elicited a diplomatic visit to President Franklin Roosevelt by Prime Minister Winston Churchill arriving in America on December 22nd. A few days later, amidst the White House Christmas Eve service and the radiant tree lighting ceremony, both leaders stood as beacons of hope and unity by addressing the nation. Standing before the gathered crowd in a bank of radio microphones, the president spoke with conviction. Quote, There are many men and women in America, sincere and faithful men and women who ask themselves this Christmas, how can we light our trees? How can we meet and worship with love and uplifted hearts in a world at war, a world of fighting and suffering and death? Our strongest weapon in this war is that conviction of the dignity and brotherhood of man, which Christmas day signifies more than any other day or any other symbol against enemies who preach the principles of hate and practice them. We set our faith in human love and in God's care for us and all men everywhere. End quote. Prime Minister Winston Churchill resonating with Roosevelt's sentiments 
declared that day to be a strange Christmas Eve. After admitting the reality of a deadly struggle of war around the world, he added, quote, Here in the midst of war, raging and roaring all over the lands and seas, creeping nearer to our hearts and homes, here amid the tumult we have tonight, the peace of the Spirit in each cottage home and in every generous heart. Therefore, we may cast aside for this night at least the cares and dangers which beset us and make for the children an evening of happiness in a world of storm. Here then, for one night only, each home throughout the English-speaking world should be a brightly lighted island of happiness and peace. Let the children have their night of fun and laughter. Let us grown-ups share to the full of their unstinted pleasures before we turn again to the stern task and the formidable years that lie before us, resolve that by our sacrifice and daring, these same children shall not be robbed of their inheritance or denied their right to live in a free and decent world. End quote. These were truly dark days. But the following morning, Christmas of 1941, President Roosevelt took Winston Churchill to Foundry Methodist Church, about a mile north of the White House, for a Christmas Day worship service, their voices joining in the traditional courses of Christmas hymns. Among these was O Little Town of Bethlehem a hymn unfamiliar to Churchill, but one that carried profound meaning to him. Its verses, especially the line, Yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight, seem to capture the very essence of that historical moment for Churchill. In David McCullough's book, In the Dark Streets Shineth, a 1941 Christmas Eve story, he reflected on this scene, particularly imagining Churchill and Roosevelt singing that line. He noted with a hint of affection, quote, And as would be said of the Prime Minister, he always sang lustily, if not exactly in tune, end quote. Forgotten is an Unseen Hand Media production written and produced by me, Ronnie Brown. You can find out more about this show at ForgottenPodcast.com. I'm also on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Forgotten Podcast. Forgotten is available on all the most popular podcasting apps, so be sure to subscribe, rate, and review. And again, if these stories teach us anything, it is this that God is in control, that grace is more than enough, and that Jesus is our only hope.